Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on. In childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hi there, and welcome. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and today we're going to be talking about advanced placement courses, also known as AP courses. We'll be talking to Chester Finn Jr. and Andrew Scanlon about their newly released book, Learning in the Fast Lane. Fall is prime time for gifted ed conferences. I know that there are a lot of states that are prepping for their conferences over the next few months. I will be at my home state's conference in October. The Gifted Association of Missouri Conference is here in St. Louis in just a few weeks. And if you are traveling to Albuquerque this November for the National Association for Gifted Children Conference, I will be there too. So be sure to catch me and say hello. Don't forget that if you haven't already subscribed or left us a review on your favorite podcast platform, it only takes just a few seconds and it makes a huge difference for us. Up next... I'm Andrew Scanlon. I'm a research and policy associate here at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. I've been working here for about three and a half years now. I'm uh, Chester Finn, the former president of the Fordham Institute and uh, now a senior fellow here as well as at the uh, Hoover Institution. And once upon a time, close to 60 years ago, I benefited from the advanced placement program myself. Stay with us. Previously on Mind Matters. Hi, I'm Anne Lipkowski Shoplick. More and more today, a solution being considered for academically advanced kids is acceleration. Having a student enter kindergarten early is actually the least disruptive form of acceleration, both in terms of academics and then also socially. So what are some of the specific signs that indicate that a student might be a good candidate for acceleration? Things like this child learns quickly and easily and has terrific verbal skills, uses very complex sentences, early math skills. A lot of very bright young children show an early interest in time. You know, they're really fascinated by clocks. Early entrance to kindergarten has long-term consequences, and it's important for people to sort of process the thinking about that. These students are going to be ready for college at a younger age than typical. Look for episode 34 wherever you get your podcasts. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. So we're going to be talking AP today with Chester Finn Jr. and Andrew Scanlon. So guys, before we get started, why don't you give us just a quick refresher and describe AP for our audience? Surely it is a set of high school courses that can yield college credit uh, given generally to smart high school students historically in the upper grades of high school, followed by an exam at the end of the school year with an external scoring system of one to five. And if you get a three or better, and they're tough three-hour exams, get a three or better, you are in most colleges eligible either for actual credit upon arrival or at least skipping a boring freshman course. (laughs) This has become an enormous program, uh, up to five million students, uh, up to five million exams a year now by almost three million uh, high school students spanning 38 different uh, subjects. A lot of our audience works with gifted and high ability students, whether they're teachers or perhaps they are parents. And I think a lot of people kind of know about the college credit, but there are definitely other benefits that go along with that, both for the students and for the schools. Can we talk a little bit about what some of the benefits of the AP program are? Absolutely. AP is about as close as we've got at a large scale to a gifted and talented program for high school students. Most states and districts uh, with which have any, any gifted and talented at all can find them usually to the elementary and middle grades. Uh, AP is essentially a gifted and talented high school program that is now operating in about 70% of all U.S. high schools. So the credit and college admissions advantages that it may give kids are pretty obvious. But what's slightly less obvious is the exposure to college-level content and rigor and teaching and assignments and the kinds of study skills and homework skills and writing skills and so forth 
that uh, a good college typically expects you to have when you get there and which many high schools otherwise don't supply. So for an able, um, energetic, and um, motivated uh, high school student, um, this is a terrific way to actually get some college-type experience and college-type uh, learning while you're still in high school. And incidentally, also avoid being bored to death during your uh, senior and junior years. I think you're right. I think um, most of the schools that I'm familiar with definitely do confine that gifted and talented programming to those elementary and middle schools. Some high schools have some sort of support, but not always. I think one of the other things about AP, there's not necessarily that barrier of testing into the program. Is that what you see in most schools? Can most kids just kind of enroll if they're ready? Or how do students go about that process? Historically, AP in many high schools was what they call a gated program. You had to have a teacher recommendation or a certain uh, grade point average or score on something in order to be uh, admitted. Uh, And some teachers uh, like to preserve the exclusivity of their AP classroom for kids that they uh, basically wanted to teach and kids they thought would do well on the exam at the end of the year, making the teacher also look good. But uh, over the uh, last couple decades, as AP has become uh, pretty democratic and has has really sought to attract uh, non-traditional students as well as traditional AP students in most high schools, most of those barriers, not everywhere, but most of those barriers have fallen and most high schools, including now many high schools that serve disadvantaged kids, are encouraging uh, students to at least attempt an AP class and to uh, then take the exam and to benefit from the experience and with any luck, also benefit from the exam score. Yeah. I know that one of the things that I run into when I'm working with families or talking with schools is about twice exceptional kids. So kids who are gifted and then have a diagnosis of dyslexia or ADHD. Do you think that AP can still be a valuable tool for them as well? Or are there barriers that kind of hinder them from being able to access Well, this wasn't something we specifically looked into for the book. Uh, And obviously, the viability of this will depend on the nature of somebody's uh, disabling condition. Uh, But uh, mostly, a kid who is intellectually sharp and eager to learn, I believe, will find adequate accommodations from most AP teachers in most AP subjects. Now, it'll depend, obviously, a little bit on the subject. Um, If you have um, serious vision problems, for example... Uh, the studio art course might be a challenge, but uh, I think for most subjects, it's not going to be a problem. One of the things I know you talk about a lot in the book is about the school culture and the environment for a successful AP program. And that, I think, entails a lot of things that schools have to kind of grow into as they gain these programs or grow these programs. What are some of the things that you really noticed in the environments where AP was very successful? What, what did they have in place? I mean, many of the things we saw from our case studies and from our research uh, were many of the typical things that we now associate with many good schools. I mean, solid, consistent leadership. Uh, Teachers, you stick around for a couple more years. uh, There isn't a high turnover rate, for example. You have linkage between uh, the middle school and high school and and connections to even what they did before that. Um, You... Really, where AP is seen as a real driver of successful student outcomes, where it's really put central to what the school is doing, we've seen a lot of that. That's usually where we see uh, or have seen the best results. Mm-hmm. And conversely, the difficulties arise in situations where, for example, the superintendent wants a high school to do more AP, but the people in the high school don't particularly want to do it. Right. Uh, At that point, it's hard to make it uh, implant in a, uh, shall I say, hostile environment. But if the uh, leaders of the school are game, as Andrew was saying, and if the teachers are uh, eager to... uh, take on the extra challenges of teaching an AP course. And many of them are, are love it because it's, it's stimulating for them too. Uh, but if they are, uh, you know, tenured people who are set in their ways and accustomed to teaching the same old, same old every year, and they don't want to change, then it's going to be hard to uh, implant a successful AP program in a school that uh, doesn't have grownups that are willing to uh, start it and stick with it and encourage kids to venture into it. Yeah, I mean, the AP courses are, are rigorous, they're tough, they're externally validated, which means there's, you know, if, if it's 
if it's not being taught in a certain way or, or, if, or if the teacher isn't fully bought into it or, or the school isn't fully bought into it, I mean, those, those show up, you, they would, we assume they would show up in the results. Um, it's, it's tough. Uh, and you need to have a whole host of different things ho- helping uh, teachers such as professional development or uh, resources that can, can really help, help them lift up uh, the quality of the, of the coursework. Um, it's not easy. Uh, when we see it work, uh, best, it's where all these factors are present. Where we've seen it be more of a challenge, there's been consistent issues of poor turnover, uh, lack of district leadership, school leadership, um, and these are common for many, many reforms. Just one other thing, as the AP has democratized, it's meant that the uh, classrooms, many AP classrooms, have a broader or more diverse collection of kids in them. Uh, once upon a time when an AP teacher could count on having only superstars in their classroom, teaching was sort of easy and fun. As you get more kids persuaded to try AP who don't necessarily arrive with, let's say, the middle school skills that they need, and in some cases were talked into trying AP without necessarily being a, a eager beaver, uh, teachers are having to differentiate instruction, and I think the fashionable word these days is scaffold their instruction so that they can deal with the less eager students as well as the s- traditional superstars in the class. So it's not easy to be an AP teacher, but on the other hand, as I said a moment ago, uh, many teachers find it um, extremely rewarding, not just for the classroom stimulation, but also for b- being part of this big national thing called advanced placement, which leads to all kinds of networking and colleagueship for them as well. Is there any specific type of training or support that is available for the teachers that are going to begin teaching this or, or maybe have taught it? Or is it basically teachers who are already in that subject area who then kind of step up to the plate and then try to align themselves with the college board expectations for AP programs? There are a million uh, workshops and institutes and professional development opportunities for teachers that are either new to AP or experience with AP, where you can go often on a university campus. I visited one of them in connection with the book research uh, for a day or a week or a couple weeks and learn from veteran instructors, learn from uh, college professors, uh, be briefed by college board experts on the latest wrinkles in the curriculum, uh, pick up pedagogical tips and curricular uh, enhancements and shortcuts and so forth. So I don't think you can, I don't know any any way of training from the beginning, coming out of college yourself, training to be an AP teacher. But if you are knowledgeable about your, the subject that you'll be teaching, there are plenty of ways that a teacher of whether it's math or history or art or music uh, can acquire the additional know-how to handle an AP class pretty well. But one thing to just uh, expand on that, um, I mean, it does also depend where you're a teacher in what school and what part of the country. One thing we show in our book is that it does matter where you are, that there are disproportionately less access to AP in rural schools, for example. Um, and if you don't have AP offered at your school, it's, it's going to be tougher, obviously, than if you're at a school maybe in D.C., which offers 20 different uh, courses. And there's even such variety even within different cities. So it's tough if you don't have that program at your school already. And for some AP courses, um, such as the sciences, I mean, there are a lot more resources needed to get that course off the ground in a school. Mm. You would need, for example, ready access for a laboratory for your science students in a way that a general science course might not need it every day or might not need it at all. One other point on the teachers, which is that almost all of the professional development opportunities that I'm aware of are voluntary, which is to say teachers have to want to get them. And in some cases, they have to pay for them because not everybody's school district uh, pays for you to go to one of those summer institutes, for example. And so there is some risk that a uh, either uh, less than eager teacher or a teacher without any resources to draw upon uh, may not succeed in getting access to the best of the training opportunities and professional development opportunities. You mentioned a little bit um, in one of your previous answers about the middle school and the kids who are incoming to the high school. And I, I know there are also kind of some 
available pre-AP courses as well. But I imagine that that buy-in for the school culture and the environment is not only the administrators, but I think also probably those lower level schools too. Would you say that that is something that having the AP programs at the high school influences and how so? The AP program and the college board have very limited leverage with middle schools and elementary schools. So it is a a serious risk, particularly for disadvantaged kids coming out of a mediocre or worse middle school, is that they won't be ready for AP when they get to high school, even if the high school has a pretty good AP program. Now, a good high school can do a fair amount of readying kids during ninth and 10th grade, even if they came from a bad middle school, so that they'll be primed for AP courses and AP success in the 11th and 12th grade, let's say. But uh, it's a whole lot better if uh, smart kids arrive in ninth grade with a body of uh, skills and knowledge that makes them uh, an easy fit for an AP course, which can start as early as, as, as early as ninth grade. The pre-AP courses that you referenced are given during ninth grade. And uh, there's a new suite of pre-AP courses just out from the college board that I think does as well as a high school can be expected to do with ninth graders to get them ready. But you're best off, obviously, if you come from a school system, if you go to school in a school system where the uh, feeder schools into the high school are as good as the high school and where the teachers in the middle school understand that they are, among other things, getting their students ready for AP type work in high school. And that's often to be found in a well-run school system, especially a prosperous suburban school system. Uh, It's a harder lift, a heavier lift in an urban district where you don't have very close coordination between the middle schools and the high schools and where the district is, let's say, trying to expand AP access at the high school level but it isn't able or hasn't figured out how to make the corresponding changes in the middle school, which of course would also reverberate back down into the elementary school. So this is, this comes through pretty clearly in some of the case studies in our book, especially of Fort Worth, Texas and New York city. We've talked about the obstacles to schools who would like to start offering AP courses. Are there groups or organizations that help those schools or is that even a thing? It's being done, and there are excellent organizations like the National Math and Science Initiative and the Equal Opportunity Schools Initiative that uh, these are not big nonprofits that work with schools and school systems to open up AP to more kids, and they provide technical assistance and, in some cases, private dollars that pay for things that, um, that are needed to implant an AP program or expand an AP program or get more kids into an AP program. So there are a lot of assets you can draw upon. Uh, to deal with these obstacles. Uh, I don't want to minimize the obstacles, however. Yeah, I mean, one of the major obstacles which the College Board has been dealing with for a number of decades and which EOS and NIMSI, the National Math and Science Institute, are constantly dealing with is just when you're talking about opening access to traditionally, uh, historically underserved kids, you can't necessarily expect that everything will be changed overnight. And it, it takes time to build up culture, an AP culture in schools that haven't had it before or anything like it before. And we're seeing this even in our book. And when we look at the data, like that there are some teething problems uh, at every level. And where we see progress, sometimes it's not as evident in this many kids are increasing their number of threes, fours, and fives. Maybe it's the kids who are increasing their numbers of twos. Maybe there's some evidence there that something's happening, but it's we're in the middle of the process. It's, it's a long process. And you're not, you're not just dealing with AP, you're dealing with sort of a history of, of, of poor instruction in, in those schools or with those students. You're also, just to wrap this one up, dealing with the issues that kids bring with them into school. AP, for example, almost all those courses uh, require quite a lot of homework and uh, often hours a night. And if you've got issues at home or in the neighborhood that make it impossible for you to do that homework, Uh, it's less likely that you're going to be a big success in that AP classroom or on that AP exam at the end of the year. And some of these supplemental organizations uh, like uh, NIMSI and EOS do things like offer Saturday coaching classes to give kids extra study skills. Uh, But uh, for that to succeed, for that to actually help kids, uh, they've got to be able to get up and get transportation and get to the Saturday session on a pretty regular basis. 
So there are the kids bring with them challenges that aren't just school challenges. One of the big themes in the book um, that you come back to as you go through the different case studies is about the influence of AP courses and how that influences equity and the excellence gap in kids' achievement, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds. There's a lot of focus on getting kids to a score, three, four, or five, that's going to get them that college credit. But there was one quote that really kind of spoke to me um, from a teacher where you said, you know, if I can get a kid to a two, it'll have done some good. It'll show that something happened. Can you talk a little bit about the influence of AP courses on that excellence gap and where, if we're looking to the future, how that can help us achieve our goals for high ability kids? I think the biggest education uh, sort of tragedy in the country today, well, there actually, there's several, but one of the biggest education tragedies in the country today is the, are the high ability kids from disadvantaged backgrounds who do not have their potential fully cultivated by the schools that they attend. Uh, High ability kids from upper middle class backgrounds generally have adults to navigate them through the education system, and they are most often able to find a school, uh, be it public, private, charter, whatever, that meets their educational needs. But uh, poor kids, minority kids, especially if they're stuck in uh, bad urban school systems or bad anything schools, frankly, uh, don't get their potential fully cultivated. AP is a very good tool for cultivating that potential among disadvantaged kids and thereby closing, narrowing, reducing the the excellence gap uh, or gaps, plural. But there are two big parts to this. One is three, really. One is getting kids access to AP at all, making sure that their high school has it. Uh, A second is um, having them ready to succeed in it. Uh, And then the third is actually enabling them to succeed in it, not just to pass the class in the teacher's judgment, but also to do okay on the exam. You'll get valuable skills from the experience of being in the class, and getting that two on the exam does prove that you learned something. But you won't get the ultimate payoff of um, a real admissions boost or a real head start on college unless you're able to get a so-called qualifying score, which is three or higher on on that scale. And uh, one of the big problems that we uh, reveal or, or, or focus on in the book is that as the participation of poor and minority kids in AP has risen, their success rate, their qualifying score rate has actually declined. So we're having to deal with this trade-off between getting more disadvantaged kids into the program and yet not having very many of them, not nearly enough of them, succeed as measured on those exam scores. This is arguably one of the biggest challenges ahead, but it's one worth tackling because if successfully tackled, uh, it will do more at the high school level than just about anything else I can think of to uh, reducing the excellence gap. Yeah, I mean, looking at the data over the last couple of decades, many, many, many more kids who otherwise historically wouldn't have had access to AP are taking AP. Uh, and many, many more kids are doing better at AP. They're getting threes on the exam, but their pass rates are still dropping. And that sort of signifies that there has been a huge influx of new children in these exams and not everybody is uh, being successful on it. But, I mean, we've seen trends over the last couple of decades that show that the gaps that are opening up between different groups of kids is actually sort of stalled and hasn't got much bigger. That even though the program has continued to expand over the last 10 years, the gaps haven't necessarily gotten bigger, which to me is a sign of hope. But the gaps are still there. Let me try to illustrate with a kind of hypothetical uh, set of numbers. Um, Imagine a high school where historically 20 poor kids got into AP and 10 of them got uh, qualifying scores on the exams. That was yesterday. Now, tomorrow, 100 poor kids get into AP and 30 of them get qualifying scores on the exams. So you've added 20 successful poor kids to the population in that high school that get qualifying scores on AP exams, which is a wonderful thing for those 20 more kids. But the pass rate among poor kids in that high school on AP has gone down from 50% to 30% uh, in this hypothetical example. Uh, You've benefited some kids, but you've reduced your rate. And then you got to wonder about those other 70 kids who didn't get the qualifying scores. 
Uh, many of them, I think, did get something out of the experience, and a fair number of them would have gotten twos on the exam, proving that they actually did learn something in the course. But others may have gotten discouraged, and it was a harder challenge than they had banked on. They might have even gotten uh, demoralized by the, 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 the this interaction with college-level material. Yeah, I mean, we, talking to people on the ground, especially during our case studies, there seems to be a value that a lot of teachers and school leaders see in in getting a two. I mean, you can get a one by just putting your name on the paper. Uh, a two shows that something happened. You learned something, but you're not quite out of three. We do think that that matters. We'd like to see a lot more research into the actual uh, effects of getting a two on an AP exam. Um, but let's not Let's not ignore the fact that we, if you consider three to be, and the College Board does, as an indicator that you are, uh, you've, quali- you've got a qualifying score, you're, you're ready for college, uh, then we shouldn't be dropping that bar sort of for the sake of it. We still want to see more kids achieving that goal. And to be clear, a three doesn't just mean you're ready for college. It actually, according to the College Board, means you are ready for the next course in college um, beyond the one that you just got a three in. So for many kids, that would be the, instead of uh, Econ 101 or, or Calculus 101, it would, be, it would be the 202 course in the college, which may get you credit and certainly skips you over what might otherwise be a boring or repetitive freshman year course. Has the average score for AP classes changed or is it pretty close to what it's always been? The average score, I think, across the country has barely budged in the last 10, 12 years. Um, But importantly, it's dropped just below three. It's now two point something close to three, right? So yeah, and and on paper, that looks like a small drop. If any, it's it's barely budging. But I mean, the difference in a three and two, um, it still means something, I think, in our opinion. Another thing that you come back to throughout the book is this connection between the results of these kids who take AP courses and what happens to them, you know, in the long run. I think a lot of the research shows they're more likely to go on to college and have have these other things. But then you also really recognize this difference, like is this correlation or causation? Like what's really leading to this? What are some of the things that you discovered as you were doing the research and writing this book about this particular piece? The College Board has done a lot of research on their own pr- program, which I guess isn't too surprising. Um, and over a long period of time, so there's a difference between what the College Board has researched in the last couple of years and maybe 20 years ago. And we dug deep. And if you, if, if listeners want to li- read our book and look at the last appendix, we, we dig deep into sort of what the research says about AP. And about dual enrollment. Yeah. I mean, generally, and there's a lot of external... Uh, research on AP too, but generally what we see, if we were to sort of put it into a nutshell, um, is that AP seems to correlate with positive post-secondary outcomes, especially if it's, if it's a qualifying score or a three, a three, four, or five, or, and also when it's in a, an exam which uh, is continued by the student into post-secondary level. So if, if it's a math exam or a science exam, that they continue with it in post-secondary level. There's a lot of research on this, um, and we seem convinced that generally, yeah, getting a qualifying score matters. Um, but we would like to see more research in certain areas. For example, what value is getting it to? I mean, on the ground, we're hearing that a lot of teachers are seeing a lot of value in that, but we're not seeing too many studies which really dig deep into it. Or what's the difference between a three, four, and five? I want to put this more simply, actually. Uh, there is a correlation between doing well in AP and going to college and completing college. Uh, and indeed going to a four-year college and completing college. Uh, And uh, this is pretty well documented by just about everybody's research. The causation question is the conundrum here, as it is in all of education, because basically you never end up with the kind of true experiment that would enable you to isolate this intervention from everything else that's going on in the kid. Motivation, for example, or parental involvement or other things going on in the school. And because there are no true experiments with a real control group, uh, it's essentially impossible to prove causation. There is one study underway right now with, I think, support from the National Science Foundation that is running something very close to a true experiment with AP. And they're being very hush hush about their findings because it isn't done yet. But uh, we can say, and we say in the book, that the early early clues from the evidence that is being gathered so far 
does point to a causal effect, points in the direction of a causal effect of having done AP, not just a correlational effect. But uh, the problem we're talking about here, the causation versus correlation, is ubiquitous in, in education reform of every kind. And I don't think it's one that's going to be readily solved. I mean, one major thing we also see is uh, selection bias, right? So kids who may or may already be on track to do well in uh, school and in, in, in college are, are more likely to take AP and do well in it and then do well in school or college. This is not unique to AP. Uh, we also see this with research into dual credit and other programs that are, you know, are voluntary for kids to take. More recent research tends to mitigate for this with uh, more rigorous research design, that's for sure. Um, some older research will, would be needed to be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt based on that, too. Sure. And let's be clear that to open doors of opportunity to kids, even if they're kids who were going to go to college anyway, uh, to enable them to get to a better college, to enable some kids to get to a college they never thought they would aspire to, to enable them to skip a boring course, to enable some of them to graduate earlier, uh, to uh, turn some kids on to intellectual excitement, to keep them from being bored in high school. Uh, there are a whole variety of benefits associated with AP that I think are notable and very much worth worth getting for as many kids as possible, uh, even if we don't have a causal effect that we can prove. And talking about those those qualifying scores, you know, if it's a three or above, I know one of the criticisms that people have about AP is that a child might go through and take this whole course and then not get a qualifying score. And so some people lean towards dual credit as an alternative option, which basically means, you know, they kind of take a college level course, but then get both high school and college credit for it. What are some of the comparisons between AP and dual credit courses? Dual credit has emerged over the last uh, 15 years or so as the only sizable alternative to AP for getting college credit while in high school. For a long time, AP was essentially the only show in town. Now there are several. The other one worth noting is the International Baccalaureate Program, but they're more even than that. IB, the International Baccalaureate, has in common with AP the external scoring, the external exam, and the uniform standard across the country and indeed around the world. The biggest issue with dual credit, which many, many community colleges are pushing hard, uh, some community colleges, frankly, need more students. And if they can get them while they're in high school, then keep them when they go to college. The community college is pretty happy about that. The issue with, with dual credit is a quality control issue. The instructor's grade is the only thing that determines whether you get the credit coming out of a dual enrollment or dual credit course. And there's no external validation in most cases. There are some happy exceptions. Uh, we ran into a really good program at the University of Texas at Austin, for example, with some serious external validation. But for the most part, it's the instructor's grade in an era of grade inflation that determines whether you're gonna get college credit at the college that gave you the, the dual enrollment course, which as I said, is typically a community college. All sorts of issues then arise. It's possible to have dual enrollment credit when you get to college and yet still need remediation when you get to college. It's possible that you have credit at the college that gave the dual enrollment course, but it doesn't transfer to the college you really want to go to. It's possible even that the dual enrollment, which tempts you into the community college, will keep you from thinking of yourself as material for what might be a better college for you, uh, because you've got the easier and maybe cheaper course to go to stick with the college that gave you the dual credit class. So there are a lot of issues here. It's a huge topic. It's going to be one of the big challenges ahead for AP. But it's also going to be one of the big challenges ahead for American education. The book is Learning in the Fast Lane, the Past, Present, and Future of Advanced Placement. Andrew Scanlon and Chester Finn Jr., thank you so much for the insight. Happy to do it and nice to be with you. And we hope they will all want to read the book. Thank you so much. We really appreciate being on the show. Let's get the perspective of an AP teacher now. Grace Perkinson, and I teach AP European History. Our principal at the time said to me at the end of one school year, she said, oh, by the way, you're going to be teaching AP Euro next year because the teacher who had been teaching it retired. And I said, well, I don't know that I want to teach AP Euro. And she said, well, it doesn't matter because you're on the schedule, you're teaching it. So here I am 17 years later. When I think back to that first year, 
even though I went through the AP training and it was, and the AP training is very, it's a lot. It's very draining. I was very naive that first year. I don't think I really understood exactly what I needed to do for my kids. And as I've gone through the years of reading up on, you know, what the college board expects and I've gone to more training and whatnot, I'm a very different teacher today than I was that first year. So I think I was just naive that first year. I don't really think I really understood the program or really what I was supposed to be doing, to be honest. What are things that you see that people don't understand? I think um, the big thing is they don't understand how stressful it is for the kids and for the teachers. Um, You know, because we have to get through quite, especially in the histories, we have to get through quite a bit of information before that national exam. And so for AP Euro, our exam is the first part of May, like I think it's May 6th this year. And so I just pray for no snow days because those are those are instructional days lost for me. And I teach primarily sophomores. They've never had AP before. I'm the first AP experience. So, you know, I have to lead them through absolutely everything. And so I think um, parents and, and other teachers think that teaching an AP course is easy. Sometimes I get that impression. Oh, well... You know, you have the smart kids. Well, that's true. That's true. But they still need guidance and they've never done this before and it's stressful for them. And so I think it's the stress level This is what I would say people don't get. What benefits do you see most for students? It helps them think critically, especially with the histories. I, I, I don't know anything about the English or the other AP courses, but I know in the histories, you know, they have to learn to interpret primary documents and be able to determine bias and, you know, be able to understand why would this person in this time period think the way he or she does? What do I know about them? It helps them develop a deeper level of thinking. What do you see as the benefits or the drawbacks of dual credit when it's compared to advanced placement courses? Well, you know, dual credit, you don't have to take that exam to get the the credit. Well, dual credit, as long as you pay your money and you maintain, I believe it's a C, um, in the course, you're going to get your your credit. With AP, you know, it's one test. You know, depending on how well you do that day, it's one day that's going to determine whether or not you get that credit. I had a kid one year, should have gotten a three, but on the document-based question essay, which is the big essay on the AP exam, the question was asking, the documents were about the 30 years war, and he wore about the, wrote about the Glorious Revolution, which are two totally different events. And so he lost all those points. So, you know, was he nervous? Probably, because he was a kid who knew his history. But I think he got a little bit overwhelmed. And so I just having that one snapshot, I think, sometimes is a, is a disservice to some kids. We see the scores in July. Um, so June is, is the month that I give myself off from AP worry. I worry about AP all the re- other months of the year, but June is my free month. And so when I, you know, when I see the scores, there's always like butterflies in my stomach, you know, how'd they do, who did what? And then a week, about a week later, um, and getting the scores is always nice because it's nice to see how the kids did. But then I, uh, a week later, I get my instructional report from the college board. And that lets me know as a group how they did with the multiple choice, as a group, how they did with the writing. So with this year's group, they did not do well with the multiple choice, even though we worked on that. Maybe that's something I need to um, focus on. But we'll see what what this new crop does of kids because kids are kids and are different. You know, so these kids may may do really well right out of the gate with a multiple choice. So we'll just have to see. The College Board did a redesign five, six years ago and uh, totally redid the writing rubrics. The multiple choice is totally different. Having taught... The old test and having teaching this one, I think they've made it much more rigorous. I think the test is harder. Don't get me wrong. The test was not easy before. It was still hard. Um, But what I like about the redesign, especially with the multiple choice, is that now they have a a stimulus. So they have a map or they'll have a passage. And then they have three or four questions attached to that stimulus. So what I like about that is that it makes the kids think a little bit more critically But maybe it's not something they know a whole lot about, but they can figure out by using dates and by looking at titles. They may be able to figure out figure out answers. And I also like that the College Board took away the they used to have a penalty, a quarter point penalty for guessing. 
and now they don't do that. Is the testing procedure different for kids with a 504 or an IEP? The College Board allows for accommodations. So with 504s and with IEPs, all we have to do is submit the IEP, submit the 504, and kids very often time will get extended time. Um, sometimes they can take the test by themselves. I've not had this, but I know sometimes I think they can get scribes. So the College Board allows for accommodations. How does it work out for those kids? I had a kid one year who had probably a 15-page IEP. I didn't know him before I met him. And I thought to myself, holy cow. You know, because some of his issues were um, reading comprehension and writing. And I thought, oh my goodness. But this kid, when he got into class, was a history kid. This was what he was interested in. And he got a four on the exam. What else do you think our listeners should know about AP courses? You know, I just think that advanced placement classes do a really good job of challenging kids. They do a good job of really allowing kids to see where they can go. You know, I've had kids come in here not thinking that they can do anything with AP, ended up doing well in the course and getting a three, four, five. It can be a confidence builder for sure. And that's and I think that's important too. That's Grace Perkinson, who's been teaching AP Euro for 17 years. Advanced placement courses and the College Board have their critics, but opportunities for high-ability students to experience rigorous college-level coursework is beneficial. Maybe students are seeking an academically challenging course load, or maybe they're working to reduce the cost of college by getting some of those credits under their belt in high school. Maybe they're just trying to build their resume so that they can earn scholarships in the future. Whatever the reason, AP can help get them there. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. See you next time on Mind Matters. Try not to hold me down. Feel alive when I'm in this town. Look at those beautiful stars. I want to drive a faster car. Nothing can break me. No, no, nothing can break me. Our thanks to Chester E. Finn Jr. and Andrew Scanlon from the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Their new book, Learning in the Fast Lane, is now on sale wherever you buy books. Thanks to Grace Perkinson, our AP teacher who joined us. And thank you for listening. If you have comments or questions for us, use the contact form at mindmatterspodcast.com or get in touch with us on Facebook or Twitter. For Emily and our lighting and makeup crew, I'm producer Dave Morris. Thanks for listening. Beautiful stars, I want to drive a faster car. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.